Hello there, my name is Benedetta and welcome to Tender is the Read. I am so excited for today's video. If you're watching on the day of publishing, it's International Women's Day, the 8th of March. And the entirety of March anyway is Women's History Month. So I thought it would be the perfect opportunity to celebrate classic women writers who have changed the history of literature. Now, of course, we're all aware of the fact that until, unfortunately, quite recently, women were not as free and as independent and as able to produce creative works, be it art, be it literature, compared to their male counterparts. And this means that, of course, there are much less women than there are men remembered in the arts from those older times. But also, it means that most of the women writers that we are aware of today and we remember as some of the great classic writers actually had quite extraordinary lives in order to even succeed at what they wanted to do. So I decided to put together a cute little video for International Women's Day in which I talk about all the women writers that I like and this is classic women writers just highlighting their lives, just giving you a little bit of a roundup and giving you some of my thoughts about their works. As usual, I want to stress that this is not an exhaustive list. I had to base this on my personal experience. I perhaps would have liked to have more preparation for this, but as you can see, this channel is very new and it's very much a work in progress. So I'm just going off of authors that I've read before in the past. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to leave that like. And also, if you're not already, please consider subscribing. This is a new channel, but I would really appreciate your support. So these are some of my favorite classic women writers who have changed the course of literature history. To absolutely nobody's surprise, first up is Jane Austen. Jane Austen was born in 1775 and is the most prominent author of the Regency era. She wrote six novels, Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, Persuasion, Northanger Abbey, Mansfield Park, and Emma. She also left behind some minor works written in her youth, as well as two unfinished novels called The Watsons and Sandington. Jane Austen lived in Hampshire for most of her life in the beautiful English countryside, and she had a pretty active social life, which served as the inspiration for practically all of her novels. She was, however, a spinster, meaning an unmarried woman, which was a very precarious condition at her time because unmarried women didn't really have a place in society. However, her novels were a huge success which helped her maintain her livelihood and her status. Her novels center around young women who are usually in a quest to find a husband. But that does not mean that her stories should be misconstrued as sterile romance novels because there's so much more than that. Jane Austen had a keen eye for social commentary and biting irony, which makes her works super readable and relatable, even to this day. It's not a coincidence there are so many adaptations of her books into movies coming out literally every year. All the novels sort of focus on the same sort of settings and the same general plot points, but nevertheless, they show great variety in the way the themes are explored and which perspectives each novel takes. For example, in Emma, the teacher protagonist is a rich, popular girl who is well-loved in her village and has everything, except she has to overcome her cluelessness through the course of her novel. On the other hand, in Pride and Prejudice, the Bennett family used to be rich, but no longer is, and it's further burdened by the fact that they've got six daughters to marry off. Nevertheless, Elizabeth manages to shine above other more eligible bachelorettes, thanks to her headstrong personality and wit. Each of Austen's protagonists is overall a great representation of womanhood in the Regency era, and they remain some of the most iconic characters of all time. I've read all of Jane Austen's six novels, plus the short novella Lady Susan, which by the way is one of those books that I would recommend to beginners and more advanced readers alike, because it's extremely funny and it really is a great introduction to Jane Austen as an author. Amongst her books, my favourites are Emma and Pride and Prejudice. I read Sense and Sensibility a long time ago and I remember really liking it, especially the sisterly dynamics between Marianne and Eleanor, the protagonists. 
Northanger Abbey is different from all the rest because it's actually a satire of gothic novels which is actually quite funny but not one of my top favourites and then Persuasion and Mansfield Park are not totally my cup of tea in the sense that the protagonists are these really sort of like meek and sort of misunderstood characters but nevertheless they are quite popular in particular Persuasion and it's interesting because it's the last novel that Jane Austen wrote in her mature years and features the oldest protagonist at a whooping 27 years of age. Seriously, you need to check out Jane Austen if you haven't. You'll be so surprised by how modern her themes are. The second author that I want to talk about is the one and only Mary Shelley. So Mary Shelley had a very interesting life from the get-go. She was born Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin and she was the daughter of Enlightenment philosopher William Godwin and the famous women's rights activist Mary Wollstonecraft who wrote A Vindication of the Right of Women. Now unfortunately, very tragically, Mary Wollstonecraft passed away just weeks after giving birth to her daughter. So Mary Wollstonecraft didn't quite have a huge impact on Mary Shelley's life, at least at first. Although she did manage to be somewhat present at one of the big milestones in Mary's life. When Mary was 16 years old, she was courted by romantic poet Percy Shelley and their site of their courtship was St Pancras Churchyard in London before the grave and tombstone of Mary Wollstonecraft. If you don't see that as a red flag, bear in mind that he was married. Nevertheless, the couple eloped against Mary's father's wishes. Their relationship was turbulent at best and ended of course with Percy's tragic death at sea but I don't want to spend too much time on that. The thing that's most important about their relationship for our purposes is that they travelled throughout Europe quite a bit and on one of their travels they stopped at Lord Byron's villa on Lake Geneva. Lord Byron is another famous romantic poet and he was exiled. Story for another day I guess. And while they were spending some time at his place Lord Byron proposed that all of his guests would come up with a ghost story in order to entertain each other at night. Now unfortunately Mary just couldn't come up with a ghost story for the life of her. This frustration eventually culminated with her deciding that she wasn't gonna write a ghost story, she was gonna make up her own brand new literary genre, science fiction. That is how Frankenstein was born. She was 19. And I don't know about you, but that put a lot of things into perspective for me. <laughs> Frankenstein was published two years later for the first time in 1818. As you can see, my copy here is that edition. However, you will find that usually books specify which text it is, which year it was published, because during her lifetime, Mary did continue to edit the novel. And she published it in at least two more occasions, the latest one of which is, I think, the 1831 version. So be aware of the fact that there are different texts of Frankenstein going around. To this day, Frankenstein remains one of the most popular and famous books in the history of literature, and that is to say nothing about its role in pop culture. I read it when I was quite young, I think I was told to read it in middle school by my teachers and maybe for that reason or maybe just because of its very dark themes, it's not a story that I could totally love and embrace but nevertheless I 100% recognise its importance if only for the fact that it started one of the most popular and commercially successful genres to this day. Mary Shelley continued to write, she mostly wrote historical and gothic novels, one of the things that she did was highlighting the role of women in her books and she sort of rejected the philosophies of her father and her husband so enlightenment and romanticism respectively as she grew older so yeah definitely an author who had an extraordinary life so let's all give Mary Shelley her flowers entry number three is actually a three for one I'm talking about the Bronte sisters Charlotte, Emily and Anne Bronte were writers active in the first half of the 19th century. The fact that they are sisters should not and indeed does not take away from all of their individualities. However, their works do share a lot of similarities due to their, of course, upbringing as sisters. Born and raised around the Moors of Yorkshire, which serve as the setting of most of their novels, their stories are dark and gothic and feature strong female characters who remain iconic to this day. Despite living tragically short lives, each of the sisters received acclaim in her own right. 
Emily wrote a bunch of poems, but is most well known for her one and only novel, Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights remains one of the greatest classics of all time. It's a tale of violence, passion and intergenerational trauma that continues to amaze audiences. There is something about her writing that is so raw and haunting but also extremely beautiful. It is really a shame that she wasn't able to write anymore. Anne is the least well known and the most underrated of the sisters, a trend that was actually sadly started by her sister Charlotte. So Charlotte was actually the oldest Bronte sister, but she outlived both Emily and Anne. After they died, she started a process of preservation and republication of all of their novels. However, when it came to Anne, she was extremely critical and she went so far as to say that her novels had no value and she prevented the republication of one of them. However, nowadays, Anne's novels, The Tenant of Wildfell Hall and Agnes Grey have been largely reevaluated, and she's considered the most radical of the sisters, as well as a gnarly feminist. Finally, Charlotte was the most prolific of the three sisters, writing four novels, Shirley, The Professor, Villette, and her masterpiece, Jane Eyre. All of her novels somewhat draw from her personal experience. For example, The Professor and Villette are partially set in Belgium, where Charlotte actually went to study to become a governess. And for that reason, they are partially written in French, which, if you like me, can't speak the language, makes them a bit hard to understand. Shirley is a very interesting novel, which deals with a woman's independence or lack thereof during the Victorian era. And and actually is credited for being the book that made Shirley a female name before it had been a male name. And finally, Jane Eyre. As problematic as it is today, Jane Eyre is definitely one of those books that has completely shifted the paradigm of literature. The novel is a deep and personal exploration of a woman's life from her childhood, her growth, and it's been considered a precursor to the likes of Joyce and Proust in the way it represents a history of the private consciousness. I've actually read all of the Bronte sisters books. It took me a while, but I got there eventually. My favorites are definitely Wuthering Heights and Jane Eyre. They're not necessarily easy beginner books, but I found their narration so powerful that it was quite easy to relate to them in a way, even as a modern person. I also appreciated both of Anne's books. So Agnes Grey and A Tenant of Walfa Hall. So yeah, I would definitely recommend any of the Bronte sisters. They're all amazing. The fourth entry is George Eliot. George Eliot is the pen name of Marian Evans, who was a Victorian writer. So why is she still known as George Eliot, you may ask? Let me take a brief detour and tell you about women writers in 1800 and the use of pseudonyms. The 1800s, and for that matter, even older times than that, were a particularly hard time for women to be able to express their creative output due to the pressure of societal expectations and men in general. So for this reason, in order to be able to publish, but also be successful in their endeavor, a lot of women decided to either publish anonymously or using a pseudonym. Our dear friend Jane Austen, who we just talked about, falls under the anonymous category. In her first published novel, Sense and Sensibility, it just read by a lady, and later when she published the other novels, she was known as the author of Sense and Sensibility. The Bronte sisters were actually known as the Bell brothers, Acton, Ellis, and Kerr Bell. Now, during her lifetime, Charlotte Bronte actually revealed herself and her sister's real identity and therefore that's why the names were later changed. Whereas Jane Austen's name was first revealed in the French editions of her books. But perhaps due to the fact that Marianne never revealed herself during her lifetime, we still continue to refer to her as George Eliot. Astute readers may recognize a feminine touch to her writing, and one Charles Dickens certainly thought he did, and it actually went so far as to write to Marianne's publisher about his suspicions. And yeah, Marianne was just not impressed, and she didn't even bother replying. George Eliot was an extremely successful writer, 
her from the beginning of her publications. And her masterpiece Middlemarch remains one of the best novels in the English language according to many. Middlemarch is one of those maximalist novels that follows a village worth of characters throughout the decades of their lives. However, unlike many of the books that you may think of, the Vanity Fairs or the War and Pieces, instead of focusing on world-changing events, it is a depiction of provincial life. While Dickens tells the stories of the grimy and chaotic London at the cusp of the Industrial Revolution, Eliot's fictional Middle March is dominated by personal and family drama. Marriages blossom and fall apart and people have to worry about societal expectations and their livelihood and this also in particular highlights the role and position of women. Thanks to the success of Middlemarch, Eliot was named the greatest English novelist alive after Dickens and Thackeray had died just a few years before. She also wrote other novels. I've not personally had the chance to read them yet, but I did love Middlemarch, which I've got right here. Marian Evans was a quiet revolutionary. She lived life exactly how she wanted, living with but never marrying the love of her life, rejecting Christianity, and always putting her interests first, giving us some gorgeous literature in the process. The next author is our first American on the list and I'm talking about of course Louisa May Alcott. So Louisa May Alcott is an American novelist who is most well known for writing Little Women. She was raised in New England at a time in which a lot of experimental communities were springing up all over the United States and in fact her parents were transcendentalists. Sorry, that was so hard to say. She grew up surrounded by some of the greatest minds of her time, including Ralph Waldo Emerson, Nathaniel Hawthorne, and Henry David Thoreau. She was a feminist and an abolitionist, which is something that shines through in her writings, which are mostly set during the American Civil War, and recount the experiences of the women left behind at home to care for themselves and also contribute to the war effort from a distance. Little Women is a highly autobiographical novel. Louisa May had three sisters and she most resembled the character of Jo, the tomboy. However, one crucial difference is that while she was forced by her publisher to create a husband character for Jo, she actually never got married in real life. She actually attributed her spinsterhood to, I need to quote here, being half persuaded that she was a man's soul put into a woman's body, having fallen in love with so many pretty girls but never once in the least with a man. Historians will say they were roommates. In reality, the only recorded relationship we know about was with a boy called Laddie, who was the inspiration for our male protagonist in Little Women, of course, Laurie. The legacy of Little Women, of course, needless to say, remains super strong today. It remains such a great classic for beginners. It's great for children, it's great for adults. I actually started reading it when I was quite young and I started reading children's classics. And I also really adored its sequels, Little Men and Joe's Boys, which continue the story and focus on the generation after the March sisters. And in fact, it includes all of the children that are born from their marriages as well as new boys that get introduced as they attend Joe's school. Yeah, no, absolutely amazing, wholesome, heartwarming, absolutely great. The next author I want to talk about is one that I think is much lesser known than the previous entries. I'm talking about Frances Hodgson Burnett. So Frances Hodgson Burnett was born in 1849 and is a British American novelist who is most well known for writing acclaimed children's classics The Little Lord Fauntleroy, The Secret Garden and A Little Princess. Frances had humble beginnings. When she was quite young her mother was left widowed and because of the cotton famine that affected her native Lancashire her family actually had to emigrate to the United States. However, Frances had always been a very avid reader, so as soon as she was old enough, she was able to publish her stories and make quite a bit of money for herself. 
Her income was so solid that she continued writing well into her marriage because she was earning more than her husband's medical practice. Her first huge success was The Little Lord Found Leroy, which was an immediate bestseller and cemented her as a great children's writer. And it was actually translated into 12 languages. This book was a huge trendsetter. People started actually manufacturing Found Leroy velvet suits and velvet collars, as well as just a bunch of different gadgets based on the fashion of the book. She regularly travelled between the US and the UK owning beautiful properties on both sides of the Atlantic and she was an extremely successful woman in that sense. For that reason she did encounter a little bit of friction from the press. There were a lot of gossips about her. You know, besides this, Frances lived comfortably and was able to express her creativity to huge acclaim. While The Little Lord was a huge success at the time, it has very much faded into the background these days. Her her two other novels, The Secret Garden and A Little Princess, are much more palatable, I think, to modern audiences. They are staples of children's literature, but even for adults, I think that they are so wholesome and slightly whimsical that they are beautiful to read. So next up is Edith Wharton. Edith Wharton is an American novelist who immortalized the Gilded Age in her beautiful novels. She was also the first woman to win the Pulitzer Prize for Fiction for her first book, The Age of Innocence. She was actually born into the high society of New York City. Her family was so high society that they are set to be the Joneses from the saying, keeping up with the Joneses. Yeah. <laughs> From this absolutely privileged position, she could have been your run-of-the-mill standard Nepo baby. But no, thanks to her keen eye, she was able to look through the glittering facade of the Gilded Age. And in her novels, she beautifully encapsulates the contradiction of this time. Her stories capture the struggle between individuality and societal expectations, as well as the conflict between the old families and the Nouvelle Riche. Her most famous works, Ethan Frome, Age of Innocence and House of Mirth, are bitter stories of unfulfillment that nevertheless dazzle the reader with their beautiful poetic writing. Unlike her characters, Edith managed to hold strong to her position in society. She became one of the most popular women of high society in New York City and a tastemaker and a confidant to many famous contemporaries, from writers like Henry James to former President Theodore Roosevelt. I have read all of the three books that I've cited before, Age of Innocence, Ethan Frome and House of Mirth. And I have to say that Ethan Frome was a big fail for me. It was just extremely depressing and too much for me. Age of Innocence, kind of halfway there, I think I gave it three stars because the plot centers around an affair, which is something that I have, you know, difficulty in reading. But nevertheless, it's, as I said, very beautiful and evocative. But finally, House of Mirth is the book that made me appreciate this author. While it is, once again, a very sad story, I think that it's beautiful. I don't know, the Gilded Age is certainly an era which I find absolutely fascinating. Next up is Virginia Woolf. Virginia Woolf was a British novelist, a pioneer of the stream of consciousness narration and one of the most prominent modernists of the 20th century. She was part of the influential Bloomsbury Group, a group of progressive intellectuals in London which aimed to reject the restrictions of Victorian society. She came from a prominent family of intellectuals and with her husband Leonard Woolf she created her own publishing house called Hogarth. Virginia Woolf is well known to have had sapphic relationships during her life Lifetime, particularly with her paramour, Vera Sackville West, who was also an intellectual of the Bloomsbury Group. Virginia's sexual explorations informed her literary output too, with of course her novel Orlando being probably the most clear and obvious representation of her highly experimental style. In the novel, the protagonist goes through three centuries and both sexes, and it was dedicated to Vita Sackville West, and it is so beautiful that it has been called the longest love letter in history. Amongst her most well-known novels are To the Lighthouse and Mrs. Dalloway, which an exemplified Virginia's revolutionary writing technique, Stream of Consciousness. Through her novels, as well as her non-fiction, Virginia Woolf provides an unprecedented look at the life and struggles of women, including the difficulty in asserting one's own creativity, as well as struggles with mental illness, which plagued Virginia all her life and eventually led her to end her life. 
remains one of the foremost writers of the 20th century, as well as one of the most influential of all time. Next up is none other than Agatha Christie. The queen of crime Agatha Christie is the best-selling author of all time. She wrote 66 detective novels and various other works, including the world's longest-running play, The Mousetrap, which has been playing at London's West End since 1952. She's also the most translated individual author in history, and she's sold over 2 billion copies. Agatha Christie is well known for having created two iconic detective characters, Poirot and Miss Marple, which feature in many of her novels. Although she actually struggled to publish her first novel, audiences have absolutely taken to her tried and tested formula for mystery fiction. Typically, the plot will unfold in a constrained location like a quaint English village, or more exotic locations like deserted islands, a steamboat or a train, and they feature characters who represent various stereotypes and suspects that get subverted throughout the novel. And most importantly, there's always a motive to discover which is what leads to the resolution of the mystery. All these elements are rearranged in a myriad of ways and never fail to dazzle the reader. Agatha Christie was actually a very private person. She had a strong interest in pharmacology, which is something that she used in her novels as she was against the idea of violent deaths. Her notable novels include The Mysterious Affair at Style, The Murder of Roger Ackroyd, The Murder on the Orient Express, Death on the Nile, to name just a few. Next up is another British novelist, Daphne du Maurier. Daphne du Maurier was an English novelist and playwright. Her works are characterized by moodiness and eerie darkness and overtones of the paranormal. She mostly lived in Cornwall, which serves as the setting for many of her most famous books, including Rebecca, Frenchman Creek, and Jamaica Inn. She had a very interesting childhood. She was the daughter of theatre actors and so that allowed her to grow up backstage surrounded by many great theatre personalities of her time. And she was actually cousins with the Davies boys who were the inspiration for the Darling Boys from Peter Pan by J.M. Barry, which of course was initially a play. Du Maurier reached enormous success as a writer in her lifetime. Many of her novels and short stories were actually transposed into films in the 1940s, most notably Rebecca and her short story The Birds were adapted by Alfred Hitchcock and remain some of his most notable work. Her books offer a very complex look into the psyche of women in the 1930s and characters like Rebecca continue to haunt and fascinate readers to this day. This is actually the only Daphne du Maurier book I've read so far but I definitely have loads of her books on my TBR because I was completely taken by this one so would highly recommend you check her out. Okay, we have come to the final entry, and that is Sylvia Plath. Sylvia Plath is an American novelist and poet who wrote in the 1960s. She is most well known for her poetry, specifically the collections The Colossus and Ariel, which were instrumental in advancing the genre of confessional poetry. She wrote only one novel called The Bell Jar, which focuses around the life of a young woman and her struggles with depression. The description of her mental anguish is just so vivid and visceral, and this serves as a beautiful and powerful denunciation of medical misogyny and specifically the mistreatment of women with mental health issues in the 1950s. The novel is semi-autobiographical and in fact it follows some of the events that actually occurred in Sylvia Platt's life and of course she was immensely plagued by depression which is something that led her to taking her own life at age 30. For that reason I find The Bell Jar the more powerful and poignant and important in a way because it's really a first-hand account of something that continues to have such great stigma. In 1982 she received a posthumous Pulitzer surprise for one of her collections of poetry. She was one of the only four authors to receive this award post-mortem. Today you can also read her diaries that I've got right here which are published in several languages and her inner thoughts are so beautiful to read because she writes in the same poetic way as she writes both her poetry and her prose. Okay so that concludes my video. Thank you so much for watching. Let me know 
in the comments who your favourite classic woman writer is. I'm curious to see whether there is a consensus on any one of these women that I have mentioned or maybe one that I forgot to talk about. As always, I would really appreciate it if you would consider liking this video and subscribing to my channel and I will see you next week. Bye!